Love this podcast? Support this show through the ACAST supporter feature. It's up to you how much you give, and there's no regular commitment. Just click the link in the show description to support now. You're locked in. Look at what we have here, folks. To the only show that matters. The cream of the crop. Duke loves wrestling. And there is no one that does it better than your host. I have come here to chew bubblegum and kick ass. The Duke. And I'm all out of bubblegum. Hey, everybody, it's Smart Renegade. And, and the Renegade, Renegade Twins. Twins. And we just wanted to wish our friend Duke from, from Duke Loves Wrestling a happy eight year anniversary. And we hope for many, many more to come. Also, we're still not eating that stupid bubblegum ice cream, man. I need y'all to get in the house. house. Get in the house. Quit. Leave that man alone about his bubblegum ice cream. Well, first and foremost, welcome back to the Duke Loves Wrestling podcast, a show about pro wrestling and everything else. Let me tell you something. I have a lot of time for the entire Renegade family, Mar Renegade, uh, Mr. Big Daddy himself over there, Ace Boogie, Bird, Tebow, e- even even the animals, okay? We're, we're talking Beans, uh, Downtown, Buster Brown, Beanie Butt, Herka Jerk, Toot Toot. We love them all. Talk about nicknames. They got nicknames over there, Jack. So I, I am a big fan. I'm high on the entire Renegade family. But Charlotte, Robin, the Renegade Twins, okay, ROH, uh, you know, AEW, former Mission Pro, you you name it. They have been everywhere. NWA, they have been everywhere. They've held the gold. They beat people up. They left bodies laying all over the place. For these two talented, uh, beautiful, fantastic ladies, warriors in the ring, for they to continue to have the audacity to disrespect the wonderful cuisine that is bubblegum ice cream, it's embarrassing, okay? We're going on, what, four or five years now of these ladies disrespecting bubblegum ice cream. And I'm going to tell you folks that are out there right now, I'm disappointed in the entire state of Georgia. I have reached out. I have petitioned. I have, I have stomped my feet. I have protested. I've done everything I can to try to get somebody in the state of Georgia to come up with bubblegum ice cream so that we can deliver it to the Renegade family so that the Renegade twins can finally have the greatest dessert in the history of life. Okay, so they can stop talking trash because they don't know what they're talking about. All right. The fact that you folks in Georgia have not made it happen yet, I'm disappointed. So I'm calling on every single body that is part of Duke's wrestling crew. You wonderful listeners. Reach out to all of your friends, your family, pull strings, talk to the governor. I don't care what you have to do. We need bubblegum ice cream in the state of Georgia so that we can get it to the Renegade family so that they can make sure that the Renegade twins finally have some delicious bubblegum ice cream. I believe in you. I know that you can help me do this. We cannot stand here and have the Renegade Twins continue to run down this delicious dessert. We need to make this happen. Okay. In the words of of Thunderbolt Patterson, in the words of the American Dream Dusty Rhodes, don't let me down. Reach out. Call somebody. Okay. I'm telling you right now, we got to make this happen, folks. The Renegade Twins, bubblegum ice cream, the biggest main event in the history of dessert. I'm counting on you to make this happen with me. Come on. Don't let me down. <laughs> Eighth year anniversary, baby. We are just rolling. I'm telling you, we're having a good time doing it. I told you that's that's what Duke Loves Wrestling is all about for sure. And, you know, last week I posed the concept of past, present, and future. Huge rave reviews for that. And we're going to continue this. But on this episode, it's about the past. And Bruiser Brody, one of the biggest icons in the history of pro wrestling, his wonderful wife and widow, Barbara Goodish, she has uh, cleared out her schedule. 
She wanted to come on Duke Loves Wrestling and share information about her, her late husband, Bruiser Brody, Frank, Frank Goodish, and just talk about his wonderful career, his wonderful life as a man, as a husband, as a family person. You know, and I think that um, you're going to hear some things that you may have never known before, which is so wonderful. So without further ado, my conversation with the incredible Barbara Goodish. Good afternoon. This is Barbara Goodish, widow of Bruce Brody. And you're listening to Duke Loves Wrestling. Brothers and sisters, we are in the eighth year of the Duke Loves Wrestling podcast, and I am so honored to have the wife of one of the greatest icons in the history of pro wrestling. We are talking about Bruiser Brody, and here today, his wife, Barbara Goodish, she has some great information for us, and I'm so elated to have her on the show. So welcome, Barbara, to Duke Loves Wrestling. How are you doing? Well, thank you, Duke. I'm very happy to be here talking to you and talking to everybody else that could be out there. And uh, thank you for having me. Well, it's my pleasure. And listen, let's let's get the business out of the way first and foremost, because there is a special event that uh, is put on year by year. And I know that, you know, part of it is to memorialize your husband. What's the event that we have coming up in May? Oh, it is the most incredible event put on by SICW Wrestling, who is keeping the memories alive. It's like old school wrestling. And he's got a fan fest. Herb Simmons, who is the promoter, has this huge fan fest coming up. He did it last year, and it's even going to be bigger this year. And all the legends that are going to be there, and it's coming up on the 17th of May, and it's at the Aviator Hotel and Suites in St. Louis. And to top it off, the main event is the annual Bruiser Brody Memorial Battle Royal, which somebody gets a cup. I present a cup to everybody. The winner of that event holds the Bruiser Brody Memorial Cup for one whole year. And it's absolutely incredible. And anybody that ever gets a chance to ever be able to go to this fan fest, if you're anywhere near St. Louis or come into St. Louis, you will not be disappointed. Wow, that is just awesome. And and really, you know, we, we had Herb on the show recently and, and he was talking about it and what have you as well. Folks, you don't want to miss out. If you can, you definitely want to check out SICW.org. You'll get more information about FanFest 2, you know, hotel reservations and the whole nine yards. Once again, May 17th and 18th, Bruiser Brody Memorial here. It is going to be fantastic. Barbara, are you going to be there? I certainly am. I get in on the 17th, and on the Friday night of 17th, if you know who Bill Apter is, he is going to have a one-man show. Well, if anyone knows what Bill's all about, it is going to be a great event. So I'm in on the Friday, and then, of course, they have on the Saturday, too, they have the Fan Fest, and then at 5 p.m., they'll have, like, the St. Louis Wrestling Hall of Fame, where they have people put in, and then, of course, 7 o'clock, Hey, once again, I'm going to say it again. Bruiser Brody Memorial. And and to think that this is Herb, the Herb Simmons. Uh, Frank was very close to Herb and Larry Matisak before everything happened. And Herb is still keeping his memory alive by just having this show. And it's been going on now for so long that it's so incredible even before the big fan fest would have this little wrestling show out in out where he lives, just outside St. Louis. And it was absolutely amazing. I would go there and the people would still, I would get up and of course, because it was still the Bruiser Broden Memorial, I'd get up in the ring and the people would chant his name. They'd either be chanting Brody, 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 or another one of Frank's thing was, if, I don't know if you know this, was Huss, H-U-S-S. And the people, for some reason, would be, uh, you know, shouting, Huss, Huss, which, can you believe this? After so long, people are still remembering what Frank used to say in the ring, going to the ring, in his interviews, and it's absolutely amazing. And now that Herb is doing this fan fest, like I said, this is the second year that it's been, that, and I meet so many people, and people that remember him, and Duke, it is just incredible. 
truly, you know, your your husband, Frank, as uh, you know, we affectionately I, know him as uh, Bruiser Brody. I know. I will use. I'll say Bruiser. I, I keep saying, you know, but yeah, Frank Bruiser. But just so you, people you, know, Frank and Bruiser were well. They were quite the same people because there was two personalities. You know, Frank was dad and husband, and Bruiser was Bruiser Brody. And you know, and you know something about changing subject or anything. But what happened was, and people have asked me this too, he kept, Bruiser Brody was his profession, was his job. When he was home, he didn't lose sight of who he was. He knew the character and he knew the person, which I think sometimes when people get in the public eye, they become the character they create. That's that's excellent insight there. And, and, and it's very interesting that uh, Frank was able to leave Bruiser at the door when he came home, uh, that's a big deal. He, he wasn't chasing everybody around the house and, and, and yelling, hus, hus, and what have you. Is that what you tell him? <laughs> he, he might have. Jeff was only seven when everything happens. So, oh, no. <laughs> yeah, you know, so, uh, no, I, I, well, all dads wrestle with their boys. Sure, sure. As a father, not as bruiser, as a father. Sure. Sure, but I love but that. he would like when he would go to when he went to jo Japan and he because Japan was such a different wrestling icon than what it is you know over here that he would come up or anywhere he worked whether it was St Louis whether it was anything if he could get takes from his matches he would he would actually put it on the old VHS tapes and that and he would look. Because he could always say, I could always do better. So like I said, like someone that's in a job that always is trying to be better in the job, that's exactly how he was. And he would, you know, look at the tapes and, and I could hear him say, well, I, I could have done better. You know what I mean? So, yeah, he used it as a profession and maybe, and that's all he ever wanted to do was to keep the memory, to go to the matches and give the fans best night of their life and i think that's why a lot of people still remember him today you know I, what i find interesting about you uh barbara is the fact that you have chosen to continue to to share with fans and allow us to um you know feel you know remember your husband and and think about him and and exalt him i mean bruiser brody's a bigger deal in 2024 than he's ever been which I just find I, so cool. You know? I know. And you know, I have to thank too is, of course, Herb Simmons and rest in peace, Larry Mattersack. Yeah. They were the two that after everything happened, he was already working so hard. And they were the two people that he, I think he really admired most in the whole wrestling because they treated him good. And even now, they are still treated. Well, Larry, of course, has passed too. But Herb has always kept his memory alive. And with Larry, I don't know if you know that, I wrote a book with Larry. Yep. He, took me, he took me into writing a book, which I would never have done if it hadn't have been Larry, that taught me into it. Because the book was, it's called Brody, The Triumph and Tragedy of Wrestling's Rebel. And Larry took the wrestling side of it and I took the personal side of it so it's from the two of us we were co-authors so the two different parts the business and the personal side of it so I as I said to have Herb Simmons still in my life is such a blessing I love that and folks you can definitely check out Brody the triumph and tragedy of a wrestling rebel now that was uh, from ECW Press Went out in yes, 2007, so I believe that you know Google Books, Amazon, you should be able to still grab a copy of that. But right, absolutely, and I have I have a couple of copies left. I'm trying to get some more myself, so they can they can personally message me or ask for a friend request. Personally message me because sometimes I get so many friend requests, I don't know. It's so so hard these days because you never know who's real and who's not because sure. so many. If so many uh, pages are getting hacked these days. So always send me a personal message on the messenger. Then I can always see. And then, you know, 
uh, tell me about this podcast that you heard it from this podcast then i know send me a friend request send me a message and then i know that it's legitimate i love that so anyone listening once again duke loves wrestling if you say that to barbara she'll know Yes. That you're not some kind of scary <laughs> bot out there. You're an actual real <laughs> person in, in Bruiser Brody fan. So if you want a copy of the triumph and tragedy of wrestling's rebel, Barbara still has a couple of copies there. She may be able to uh, get you one of those. So that's that's awesome. I love that. I love that. It's you know, Barbara, it's, it's again your choice to stay connected to pro wrestling and and allow us to continue to remember your husband. Some folks don't. You know, some families, they they decide that they just don't want to go down that road at all. What made you decide to continue to be part of the pro wrestling business? Well, you see, it was probably it was probably not that long ago. It was before the book and and before that when Herb was doing his show, when he finally came out with doing a show, I stayed away from it for so long. It was Herb and Larry that got me back into doing everything. And which was really nice because I'd lost my family. I'd lost my wrestling family when everything happened. And then with Herb and Larry, I found my wrestling family again. So this is this is why I had I I'm mentioning Herb a lot, but he he has just been so blessed to be, have him in my life. So I have to well, I have, I'm not going to blame Herb because he made a great wrestling family for me. But they. They were the ones that got me back into the wrestling family. And now, as I said, I, I wouldn't do anything. I was just totally, like you're talking about, didn't want anything to do with it. But I'm so happy because I meet so many nice people, so many nice fans that will come and tell me stories of when they met him. And I get to talk to people like Duke, like you. I love that. I, I really appreciate that. That's high praise coming from you. Um, and, and shout out to Herb. I mean, you know, when, when Herb and I first spoke, literally the first time we spoke, he mentioned you. <laughs> so as yeah. much as you mentioned his name, he mentions your name and, oh. and just how wonderful it is that you're still involved and, and allow these folks to continue to keep uh, Bruiser Brody's name alive. So it's it's a mutual respect and, and love. I mean, you folks are family and, and certainly it's an honor to even be able to have this conversation because Bruiser is definitely one of my favorites. Now I gotta—I have to be honest with you, Barbara. He terrified me because he was always beating Ric Flair up, and I was a big Ric Flair fan when I was a kid. Oh, I know. So, <laughs> so it was interesting to read Ric Flair's book and to find out that um, Flair and, and Bruiser were actually good friends and even did business together as promoters or, or what have you. Right? Didn't they have a business together at one point? Oh, I just think they. They did so well together that they just did a lot of uh, a lot of the matches together. So they had had a mutual respect, which and is fact, interesting. Yeah, which and which is one of the only. See, I didn't really get to go to any of the matches. I mean, Frank was on the road all the time, and but one of the few matches that I did get to go to was in St. Louis. One hour they went with Ric Flair. The one hour draw that people couldn't believe that Frank could do one whole hour with Ric Flair because everybody still talks about that match. Well, Bruiser Brody was this big guy who, you know, is going in there against Ric Flair, who, who's considered the 60 minute man because of his stamina and what have you. And you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. Bruiser was doing drop kicks and all these <laughs> different things that you wouldn't expect from a big guy. He could move. I mean, legitimately, this guy could move. Uh, for a man his size, and, and he proved that night beyond a shadow of a doubt that, yes, Bruiser Brody could wrestle with the best of them because he was one of the best of them as well uh, for 60 minutes, and, and, and it would be something that folks would still talk about 30, 40 years later. It's just fantastic. I, I mean, boy, I'm beaming just even thinking about it because uh, this is the stuff I grew up on. You know, which yeah. which is really cool. Now, isn't there an action figure that just got released? There's from Powtown, where wrestling lives. There's an action figure. It's it's the most incredible action figure that I have ever seen. And I think Powtown is still selling them. I've I've asked to get some, but I haven't. I'm waiting to get some more. Just to, you know, because this is fantastic. I don't know if you've seen it or not. You open it up. It has all about him. It's it's so realistic too. So this is what I mean, and this is just a new one that's just come out. 
And I think now they're doing some Ramco figures of different wrestlers and that. So it's it's a business that just keeps going and going and going. Wow. And what it is is I think a lot of the people, especially the younger ones, got onto the old school wrestling, whereas the new school wrestling is not exactly the same as the old school. So a lot of them have picked up from from YouTube, from all these things that they can see some of the, well, especially Frank with some of his matches, that there was a story. There was an actual story. In fact, just a little story. I went, uh, they had, I think it was AEW back a few years ago, had a show, one of their first shows. It was here at Daytona Beach in the Ocean Center. Well, I had mentioned to somebody, hey, that's not that far from me. You know, maybe I can get a ticket. Well, Jim Ross got me a ticket, JR. He got me a ticket. Never sat in the front row before. Got me front row tickets for the show. Well, I have to admit, it's very athletic. The somersaults, everything that was going on. But I, I thought I was sitting at Circus de Sol because <laughs> it was, I, I mean, I'm not putting anything down on, these were fantastic, but it wasn't like old school wrestling where you beat each other up. This was just the somersaults, the hair. I mean, so much athletic. You know, they were so athletic, but it wasn't old school wrestling. And that made me think that's probably why the old school wrestlers are still being followed today. And these fan fests all over the country, you've got the youth that are going to them. That's a great point because in, in reality, uh, Pro wrestling was always supposed to be something that mimics a fight. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? It's two opposing sides fighting to see who the better man is. And sometimes there'll be a championship involved or money or, or a trophy. But the whole idea was two opposing forces battling against each other to see who the better person is. And yeah. once you start doing all the flipping and, the, and, the, and the, what I call flippy dippy peanut butter skippy, it's like it's just <laughs> all over the place. Yeah, right. So and and again, yeah. there's a there's an audience for that. So I'm not trying to knock it, but no. I want to see a fight. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's that's what I'm used to. I want to see good versus evil. I want to see the good guy and the bad guy, and see who's going to prevail. From an emotional standpoint, that's the stuff to this day that will always sell. So you're absolutely right. These younger kids going back in time and, and finding matches, especially a Bruiser Brody, where you can clearly see. And, and even the moments when, even though he's supposed to be a, a bad guy, the fans love to hate him. So, yeah. <laughs> so there's that whole thing, too. You know, that's that's exciting. That's that's and it's easy to process as opposed to you just saw 50 moves in one minute and you don't know what the heck just happened. You and know, there's no story. There's no story attached no, to it. No, it's it, except like you said, Cirque du Soleil. It's just wow, that was athletic. But I don't even remember what happened. I just know that no. it was athletic. So. Well, yeah, exactly. I know there was a lot of somersaults, and there was a lot of, and uh, you know, somersaulting on the floor, and they had a padding on the floor. In the old days, the old school, it was concrete. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So if you were going to pick somebody up and slam them on that, you only had Ooh. to do it one time because you knew it was supposed to hurt. <laughs> I know. That was the scary, the scary part. And that's why right now a lot of the uh, legends, a lot of the people there, you know, all the injuries they got sure. when they're out there giving their best is coming yeah. back, you know, yeah. and hurting them. And that's because they, they gave it all. In, in the old days, they gave it all. There was sure no, yeah. you know, like there was a lot saying, of knee replacements, a lot of hip replacements, oh, the whole nine yards. Replacements. Yeah. And I think that's what they're saying, too, like with the football, with this concussion. I think they started off with the wrestling, too, with getting, you know, the head, just like yep. in uh, the NFL, the football. But they're having the concussion thing, too, because yep. kind of. And that's what happens is a lot of football players will go into wrestling. Yep. yep. And as I said, probably because you're a football player, you know what pain is. Yep. I watch the, you know, I watch football and it's like, they get hit. I say, I can see. That's why when they come out of uh, football and they don't get picked up a lot of times, wrestling, I guess, is the next sport they go in because they're athletic 
and they know how to take a bump because they're, you know. It's what they're used to. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely, and it's just like anybody else or any other job. If you have a set of skills, um, why should you do something entirely different? You know what right. I mean? So if, if you if your body is built to to withstand uh, the the damage when you get hit, picked up, dropped, you, you football, you're being slammed onto the ground. So of course you can get slammed onto a wrestling ring. So you're absolutely right. That's a good call. Because I call. think like right, because Frank uh, was you know a athletic football college football player. Sure. Ended ended up at uh, West Texas State, one of his uh, schools, and of course that came out with Manny Fernandez, Stan Hansen, the Funk Brothers. I could go on and on. A lot of them came out of West Texas State. Yep. And, uh, I mean, he went as far to the Washington Redskins, but he uh, he never really played. I think he got red flag maybe one game or something. And he always said that if I had put the knowledge or I put my mind into the NFL that I did into wrestling, I probably could have gone further. But I'm young. I think I'm tough. You know how you think sometimes? Thought I was the baddest, the best. Well, no, you're up there with everybody else and there's better people if you don't put your mind to it. And that's why I think he put his mind into wrestling after that failure. And that's why today we're still talking about him. You're absolutely right. Time and history will not forget him. Uh, legitimately, yeah. the face with the big hair uh, yeah. Bruiser Brody, you can't miss it. You know that's a, that. Even people who may not necessarily know the extent of who Bruiser Brody is and historically is, they know that face and that hair. His his oh. his, his likeness has become iconic. I, I see his face on T-shirts to this day. Right, I know. You know. And I've had some of these people at some of these fan fests that I've some of the you know, places I've been. They'll come up and they say they remember him. They were a child in the airport, and then all of a sudden they saw this monster coming through the airport <laughs> with his hair out. And they said that if he saw, like if he saw them scared of their hiding, you know, because he was kind of looked like a monster, they've actually said that he actually got down and talked to them. And wow. they were, and they've said too that from that day on they realized that you can't judge a book by its cover. They still remember that he he bent down and talked because they could he could see how scared they were of this monster going through the airport. That's incredible. That's and that so, just shows that the softer side of Frank, right? Yeah. So you know, this is what I mean when I started going to these events to hear some of the stories was really incredible. Just you know, just to hear how people perceived him in those days because I could say we'd drop him off at the airport. Because this was the days where you could go right up to the door. I'd drop him off and he'd say goodbye to us. And I could see him change. As soon as he went through that door, I could see him change into his character. Mm. And then same time coming back, he'd be his character through the airport. Then he'd get to the, then he'd get out the airport, see the car, and he'd be back to Frank again. So Incredible. like I said in the beginning, to have the difference between Frank, Bruiser was quite astonishing that he could keep those two so apart. That's incredible. That's it. I, I have to ask you, Barbara, you have a, a very unique accent. So so what, what's going on here? Where, where, where are all these accents melded together coming from here? Well, I'm, I was working in Australia. I met Frank, uh, met Frank in Australia in a hotel I was working at. And uh, a little bit of a funny story. I just happened to be working the front desk when he checked in. It was a hotel where they had a tour to Australia and New Zealand at that time. So I just happened to be working in the hotel that all the boys, all the wrestlers would stay in when they came to, uh, you know, Australia. And uh, I mean, there were so many, Rick Martel, Andre the Giant. I mean, I could go on and on about the people that I happened to meet. But those were the days before there was uh, the internet and phones and things like that. So every now and then I'd have the mail and I would give them their mail because it was a lonely existence back in those days. It was too mm. expensive to keep making a phone call back to the home place. So they would, this was funny to think about. This was days when people wrote letters and sent photographs. 
you know, this was the 70s. This was 77, 78. And uh, they would show me pictures of their wife and kids and talk about how lonely they were, you know. They were all like my big brothers and that. And this one night, I just happened to be talked into doing somebody turn up. I just the nine to five. And then that was me. Was this day, the person that was doing the front desk to, didn't turn up. So they asked me if I would stay and do the three to 11. Well, when you're young, any extra money is good, as you know. You're like, oh, I'll do it. Get a little extra money. Sure. And I was just leaving, just finishing work at 11 o'clock. It's a Friday night. And they all came back from the matches. And I'd had a good friend, Killer Kyle Krupp, who passed many years ago too. Kyle, yeah. And uh, he came to the desk. He said, hey, all the guys were just going up the road to the Bourbon and Beef, which was a piano bar. You finished work. Why don't you come up there with us? I thought, well, there's no harm in that, you know. It's, you know, you work late, you kind of, you can't just go home and do regular things like you do when you're five o'clock. You know, you got to unwind a little bit. Sure. So I figured out, well, I don't see any harm in that because all these people, I, I feel quite safe, you know. So went up there. Well, it just so happened that one by one, everybody started leaving. There was a whole table full. And all of a sudden, one by one, Frank was there. One by one, they kept leaving. And then in the finish, there was three of us. There was Carl, Frank, and myself. And then Carl gets up and leaves. Well, I found out later, he I've been worked too. He worked me. He didn't <laughs> know how to ask me or do it. She, she won't come out with me. So when he saw that I was still there, he said, Carl, go ask her if she'll come up there. Then I want all you guys to leave and just leave me with her. And that's how it happened. Incredible. He worked me. He had he worked so then it was just the two of us and you know and you know Duke when when it's not a date you're yourself mm. when you're not when there's no agenda like knowing these people for all that long they get to know you because you're not trying to be anyone different you're just yourself you know I so you that. get to know you get to know the real person sometimes when people go out on their first date or whatever people try to put an impression on it's not really the real person. So you um, got to meet the real Frank, and he got to meet the real Barbara in that moment. He sure did. <laughs> <laughs> and and then, like I said, and then one he was over there for about oh, quite oh months for the following year. He came over in seventy seven, met him seventy seven, and I think in seventy eight he came back. He went back to the states for Christmas, and he came back to Australia. And then one night he came back, and. Uh, you know, I know we say everything, but Frank kind of had a reputation of sometimes of getting into trouble. You know, mm -hmm. if things, were, things weren't right. He knew he was protecting his image, and sometimes people wanted him to do things that he knew wouldn't work. He knew what the people wanted, which I gather he did because of right now that they still remember. Sure. And he wanted, he, he knew what would work. He wasn't into trying to cause trouble. He knew he wanted to make money for the boys and he wanted to make money for the promoters. He knew he was a businessman and knew what would make money. And if he could see it going the opposite way, that it wasn't going to help anything, he kind of, you know what I mean? I won't go into it. I think you know what I mean. Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. And, and you're absolutely yeah. right. He, he, Bruiser Brody understood the business. And exactly. There's no way you and I are talking about him. How, how long has it been? 34 years now since he's passed away? 88. It's, it's going to be 36 coming up in July. Jeez. 36 years later, we're still uh -huh. talking about this man. So clearly he knew something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just going to say, he clearly knew what was going on. Yeah, so you're right. Because otherwise he would have just been forgotten. Yeah. But he, he did things the way most people. But it was the way you would work for everybody. So he had been paid. He did get paid this time. Came home. Said, I'm going back to the tomorrow. Wow. Okay. Well, nice to know you. You know. <laughs> hey. That's cool. And he put this. He put this pile of money down on the table. And he said, "I want you to come over." Oh. No promises. No. 
none of, well, this is going to happen, this has happened. All the only thing he said was, I want you to come over. Well, I knew because I don't know if you know anything, but Frank was very frugal. That's why I go into another story in a minute. He was very frugal with his money. For him to put all that money on the table, he didn't have to say anything. I knew he trusted me because I could have kept that money because mm. it was quite a bit of money. I could have kept that money and bye-bye and end up with her. But no, he trusted me. So I tied up. I think it took me a couple of weeks to get over because I had all my life there to kind of finish up. I was working. I had a place. You know, so it wasn't I could couldn't just get up and leave. So two weeks later, and I thought to myself, well, I got a ticket into bought a ticket into America. We were in San Antonio. He was living in San Antonio at the time, and then to get a ticket out because to get a visa, I had to have. You can't just get a one-way ticket. You've sure. got to have either return tickets. Okay, I've always wanted to go to England. So if this doesn't work out here, I will get to go to England instead of making a return back to New Zealand. I thought this will this will put me into another place that I want to go to. Of course, that didn't. I still haven't been to England, and I'm still here. So. <laughs> yeah. he, he he put a stop to that plan. <laughs> yeah. So with that, but as I said, just being frugal. I think, as I said, when you know. It's like you said, to go out, being a business, to go out with the boys after work. Because you didn't get paid much money back in the 70s. It sure. was. You know, work for Bill Watts. I've got some of his journals, $50 for the night, or twenty, even 25 So the boys would all get one hotel room, you know, and put the mat, put mattress on the floor, and they would sleep on the mattress and the floor, and what is it, chairs or whatever. That's the only way they could afford it because there was no way they could even afford, you know, a hotel. Hotels were not paid for. And by the time you eat and the time you have a couple of drinks, your money's gone. Yeah. Plus you're putting yeah. gas. Or like he would always, the one thing I always have to pack was I'd always have to pack cans of green beans and cans of tuna. And that's what he'd do after a match, go back to his room and eat green beans and tuna straight from a can because it was protein. You figured mm. out that's a good meal, lots of protein in the tuna. Smart man. Are you are you from Australia originally? I know that you're saying you were living there at the time. But yeah. Are you from there? Originally New Zealand, but lived in Australia okay. for so many. I call Australia, well, I, now I call uh, America my home because I've been over here since 78. So sure. This, sure. this is really my home. Yes. Most of your life has been spent here as yeah. opposed to over there. Got it. Yeah. Got it. I had very, very limited times in both countries because of the amount of time I've spent over here. But I always, I always tell people, too, that if you get opportunities, go for it. You can always go back to your old life. But if you get an opportunity that sounds good, you might get an experience that you will never experience again. Because every, a lot of people, they have all these opportunities, but put too much thought in, oh, I, I can't do this, I can't do that. I mean, there are circumstances where you can't do it, but when you're young, you don't have a lot. You know, especially if you're free, you're not married, you don't have children, and something comes up, don't think about it, do it. And then you're unbelievable, the experiences you might have in life. You're still living off those experiences. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you could you're say you're that. not done yet. I'm not done yet. <laughs> <laughs> so, so when he's not eating uh, tuna and green beans, Barbara, tell me about a, a, a traditional New Zealand or, or Australian meal that you would make for, uh, for Frank, Bruiser Brody. It was, I hate to say this, his breakfast was spam. He loved spam and eggs. Can you believe that? I believe it. He probably spent a lot of time in Hawaii yeah. where spam is such a big deal. Yeah. So that yeah, makes sense. I had, I had to make sure. This is, I had to make sure I had plenty of spam. And, wow. uh, you know, and then a lot of times so he was very healthy eating. Then a lot of times his protein drinks in a blender was, I don't think they do that now, raw eggs, protein powder, chocolate ice cream, blended up like a big milkshake, and he would drink that. As a meal. That is incredible. That is, and then, I mean, he's a big hulking guy. So that, I guess that worked for him. 
Yeah, because he was over 300 pounds in those days. Wow. And I still couldn't understand how he, he could kick higher than me. That was kind of, how the hell how the blame this? Can you kick higher than me? I've never been able to kick that high. I watch every now and then I'll see a tape or something. Well, some, they'll put something on his Facebook page and his, his, his kick is so high. Yeah. It's like, yeah. you know, and this is what I couldn't understand how people did his Facebook page too, that they opened up a face, a couple, he's got a couple of Facebook pages if I remember. And it's, dang, you know, but I love it because I've seen pictures of him, especially in Japan that I've, never saw before i never saw that many pictures and it's really nice to see all these pictures of his life that that was not at home that's his life when he was out on the road that's incredible so so even to this day you're still getting uh you know fresh information and, and fresh memories uh right. from, from these experiences that he had there folks on facebook bruiser brody wrestling's last rebel it's a, a private group. There's over 3,500 people in there. Definitely, you should check it out. Great classic material, Bruiser. So many great photos and what have you. Like Barbara said, there's stuff there that gets posted that she's never even seen before. So it's it's a really cool experience uh, to to look back at one of wrestling's true icons. No question about it. A, a man who's even bigger today than he ever was in his career. It's it's amazing. It's amazing. I know. It's like I said, it is amazing. And then somebody had somebody had posted. In fact, I think it's on the posted it on the what is it? Wrestling's Rebel. Uh, and I, they sent it to me. It was uh, uh, they sent Happy Fifth Anniversary to one of the best Dark Side of the Ring episodes for season one with the late great legendary Bruiser Brody. So I guess it's the anniversary, the fifth year anniversary when that show. On Vice, you know how Vice has the dark side of the ring. Absolutely, absolutely, yes. And and what it was, uh, Jason and Evan, the two producers. Jason, uh, everyone, Huxley was the one that did it. Jason is the one with him, Eisner, and they approached me. Well, it would have been longer than five years ago now because that's when the episode aired, and they approached me. And this is the first time I'd really done anything like that, you know, that was on TV and an episode. I was a little apprehensive about doing it. But uh, I thought if I don't do it, they're going to do it. And I have no say, which happens. I would sooner do something, at least give me a little bit of say. If there's something I really don't want, you know, they would listen. Well, that was the pilot episode of uh, Dark Side of the Ring. That was their first one. They didn't know if they would get picked up or not. This was wow. like a pilot to see if it could become a series. Well, they aired one last night. I think it was on Sherry Martell, I yep. think. Yep, right. you're absolutely okay. right. Yep. Right. So this is from that first episode of Frames that they, for five years, they've been doing Dark Side of the Ring from that one episode. Yeah, that, and that series is, is fantastic. I mean, the, the, the footage that they're able to get of all of mm -hmm. these wrestling legends and the interviews with folks who tell, you know, their perspective on what has happened and what have you is, is just, it's incredible. So the fact that you were part of that, that was back in 2019. You're absolutely right. It's cool yeah, to was, hear that that was the pilot. That's, I forgot about that. Yeah, that was the pilot episode. So they, they didn't know what it would be, but they picked on that one to, uh, do it and like i said they still keep in contact as i said they thank me because they've got five years and they're still doing it i love it i love so it they well, did a good job that's up to them though because they did a good job on it so they did they did and, they and you did. know barbara I, I didn't want to go too far down that road because i, I know. know that it's a traumatic experience uh what happened to frank and i will say as a fan I've always been frustrated with the fact that there are so many different stories out there and it's hard to get a clear picture from folks. But we, what we do know is that there were, there were people there and it happened oh. and yeah. it was a miscarriage of justice. There's no, there's no two ways about it. You know? Oh, that, that, that was me because it was done over there. 
and you know i did a podcast not that long maybe last year from puerto rico which i was a mm. little apprehensive to do and uh you know talk but the way he was saying you know and i think the people it was not the people's fault you know what i mean i i wanted to make sure that i got that in that it was i think uh, i won't get too far into it but when and one of the things there there was a banner when all this was going down i had to go to the uh, home and uh if i remember rightly there was a banner that they'd put up do not blame the people of puerto rico for the actions of one man and i said no it was not anything and then when i was in uh, uh vegas last year two of puerto rican uh, ladies they were over there wrestlers they're over there one came up and just hugged me and hugged me about that podcast she said thank you for doing it thank you you know so it made me feel good you know what i mean that's a big deal that's a big deal yeah, it's a so big that, deal. that was a that was a, a a a chapter uh that was closed basically right you know? wow we, we didn't really talk about it or anything it was just sort of general in that so we didn't go into any of you know anything but as i said no as i said it's it wasn't anybody as i said it's over you know what i mean it's long gone now no you never forget but no. but you have to make a decision to, so but yeah I, I i couldn't believe it just came and gave me negra i forget her wrestling name she just came oh, rosa negra yes la rosa, negra. Like yeah. rosa la rosa thank you yeah, yeah. She, came, she just came and gave me the hugest, biggest hug, hug you could imagine and wow. thank me. Wow. That's that's incredible. That's incredible. You know? Shout out to La Rosa Negra, the Black Rose, Puerto Rican uh, legend in her own right. Uh, that's that's a big deal. That's a big deal for, for you and her to share that moment. And, right. Um, wow. That blows you know? me away. So there's things, you know, there's things that happen that you do remember. And I and always remember when she did that, because I do the registration at the CAC, the Cauliflower Alley Club. Sure, that's, sure. That's the one that kind of, it's a non-profit, but they look after uh, the wrestlers that get into trouble because there is no benefits with the wrestlers. There's nothing. They give their life and their body and they leave, but there's nothing for them. You know, there's no benefits they get nothing from the wrestling so this is sometimes they'll have trouble with medical or they'll have trouble finding rent and things and they can come to the cauliflower alley club and put put it in and they will help them you know so it is a great organization and i kind of do registration with the people checking in i sit there and help with the registration and help around that at the cac that's coming up and uh, August, it's the third week in August or something for the CAC. We stay at the Plaza Hotel. That's another good thing, people. It's a fun time down there in Vegas. I'm working, but it's still, I love it. Because then you Absolutely. get to leave. And that's why, as I said, I, I was I was even behind, behind the uh, counter or behind, you know, what do you call that? But I was behind working in the front. I had this big long. What do you call it? Table, I guess you would call it. Yeah, yes. table. And as I said, she actually came around the table to give me a hug. It I wasn't just... That. I know, so I'm always grateful for, grateful for her. It just made it made my day. Yeah, La Rosa Negra, great, great uh, friend of the show. She's been on the show a few times. Shout out to her. And also, folks, the 58th annual Cauliflower Alley Club reunion. That's August 19th through the 21st. Ooh at the Plaza Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas. You definitely want to check that out. And, and of course, you know, you, you can head over to uh, caulifloweralleyclub.org. You can grab tickets to that event. And you can also become a member of the uh, Cauliflower Alley Club, just in general. You know, support our, our heroes there. You know, B. Brian Blair and, and the folks, they've right. always been great friends of this show. And, and we love to shout them out. So thank you, uh, Barbara, for bringing them up. Big fans right. of, the, of the CAC. Sure. And... It's for such a small amount per year, and you get four magazines per year. Incredible. Incredible. Which is, which is great. And love our Brian, too. Yeah, he's a great guy. 
great guy. Mm-hmm. D. Brian Blair, great guy. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I take a lot of pride in saying this, but a couple of years back, it was on this show. That was the first time that um, B. Brian Blair spoke of the passing of his son. Oh, and I know. Yeah. He, w- he went into detail about what happened, but that was the literally it was the first time he publicly spoke about it. Mm-hmm. And I took great pride in the fact that he felt comfortable enough to do that on this show. So, yeah. you know, when, he, when you get comfortable enough to talk, I know before he came out and that it wasn't that much long, or might have been a phone call because that I'd gone through something like that. And I, I remember we talked uh, about that and it was, you know, what do you do? Because, you know, our loved ones were taken, you know, yes. you kind of, you form a bond when you meet people that have had the same experience as you. It's kind of, that's kind of like a club which you really don't want to belong to, you know. But it makes it easy talking to people that have been, because that person understands yeah. exactly what right. you, you know, exactly what you have gone through. And that, you know, because I remember, yeah, I, that was horrific. You know what I mean? It sure was. And, and, and it was, you know, for a guy that has dedicated his life to helping others Mm -hmm. and and, and B. Brian, it's, it's, you know, when you are out there helping other people and you know this, who's there to help you? You know what I mean? So the fact that he could, he could share with you and and you could provide some insight and just be a sister in, in, in this process is a big deal. So kudos to you for for extending yourself like that because he certainly needed it. Um, I that's know. A big deal. Wow. And I should be seeing him. I th- he's going to be there in St. Louis too. So it's going to it's it's always a fun time. It's like I said, it's a wrestling family, and even the fans become family too. Sure, sure, sure. You know, I love because it. we're we're all on the same level. There is no, you know, no difference in who we are. We're we're part. You go into that fan fest, you go into the wrestling matches, you go into everything, and we're all the same. And, you know, sometimes it's nice to be somewhere where there's only one thing. It's a fan fest, it's wrestling. Everything else is not important, yep. which is good. It's it's very good, especially these days. You know, we can leave <laughs> the rest of the world behind and just, yeah, just bond leave. on this thing we love. Yeah, And, and you know that. how... And you know how healthy that is just to get away. You don't watch the news. You don't listen to that. There's no of anything else being taught. It's just wrestling. Yes. I love it. I love it. Listen, Barbara, if anyone listening right now wants to uh, get in touch with you, like you said, please remind them again. What, what's your uh, your Facebook? It's just Barbara Goodish, Facebook. And if you send me a friend request, send me a little message as well telling me that you heard me on wrestling podcast yes please do and 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 she'll know again that you're a real person so then you you'll be yes. able, that's the that's the uh password so to speak you know that's a secret code and, and she'll barbara will know that you're all right you're the real code you're right that's right that's right i love that I, that's an honor and and really barbara just having you here on duke loves wrestling to share memories about uh bruiser frank to talk about the cac to talk about the uh the fan fest coming up and really just to talk about you and your life because you're just as important as everything else we mentioned and to hear about your history, it's awesome. It really is. You you are a beloved figure, an important figure in our wrestling history, and we thank you. And we know that uh, Frank is sitting here with us listening to this conversation. He's probably cracking up uh, <laughs> as he shared some of these memories. So, again, on behalf of all the fans, thank you and, and thank your entire family for sharing Frank with us. There's uh, the Luther's Dan Gable Hall of Fame in Waterloo that I attend, which is a great little, it's a smaller one, but it's a great little fan fest. I think that's coming up the 19th, July, 19th, 20th, 21st. And then also there's one first weekend in August, I think it is, the gathering yes. in Charlotte, yes. which I will be there too. So Anyone that could join any of those events, you're going to have such a good time. And please come and see me. I would love to talk to you. What a fantastic conversation there with Barbara Goodish. And I'll tell you, it, it just, it's an honor to be able to 
speak about the legacy of Bruiser Brody and and you know do our part in keeping his name alive. So the fact that Barber was able to take the time to come out here on Duke Loves Wrestling just awesome, awesome, awesome stuff. And folks, certainly you heard the name of all these events that she's going to be at personally. Definitely you want to check it out, whether it be the uh, SICW Fan Fest or the CAC or what have you. You know, definitely you get a chance to, to meet Barbara and talk with her and see what other types of merchandise that's out there related to Bruiser Brody. Check it out. Definitely check it out there. It's worth it. Um, truly one of the greatest icons in pro wrestling history. So that was fun. It's fun. Duke Loves Wrestling on Facebook, on Twitter, Duke Loves Wrestling at gmail.com. We are not going to stop celebrating our eighth anniversary of this fantastic program. In fact, you know, today is Saturday, the 4th of May, 2024. Sunday, so that's tomorrow. <laughs> I'm going to hit you with another one. There is a crazy story about uh, a promotion down in Florida. Surprise, surprise, right? Florida Wrestling Empire, FWE. They got some problems down there. And I was contacted by a number of people who were booked to be part of a show down there, one way or another. And you know, there was a lot of calamity that went on. So we're going to have a wrestler. We're going to have someone who was involved behind the scenes. And we're going to have the owner of the promotion. They're all going to come on and discuss what happened last week and what the end result is. You know, what's going to happen moving forward. So definitely stay tuned. Tune in for that by, uh, I'd say, Sunday the 5th. 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That episode should be up. Share it with everybody, of course, because it's it's a doozy. <laughs> it is a doozy, I'll tell you. Uh, and then Monday, Monday, we're going to flip it back to the fans. I have two wonderful conversations with some of our international friends. You know, we have Lee Bercy. He comes back on. This is a former elected official up in Canada. He talks about his experience at WrestleMania this year and, and some tips for anyone who's going to be attending WrestleMania going forward. And also, he shares a, a touching story about meeting Cody Rhodes' mom and sharing some information with her about his own grandmother and how Cody uh, was very polite to his grandmother. So that'll be a fun uh, conversation I definitely want you to hear. And then our friend Stella, who is a huge wrestling fan out of the UK. you know, she, She's out in England specifically, and she's just awesome awesome person. She was on my other show, Tell Us the Truth, a couple of years back. She has a great perspective about Cody Rhodes that she wants the world to hear. And I said, yeah, why not? So definitely have her on. And I also have a, a, uh, a wrestler, indie wrestler that I'm going to have on that episode as well. I'm not going to tell you who it is, but definitely somebody who I want the world to hear from. So, you know, we're not stopping. Now, after that, we have a the return of a WWE Hall of Famer who's going to give us a major update on what they have going on recently. You know, you've seen them on TV and, and what have you recently, so that'll be fun. And then we have some names in pro wrestling and pro wrestling media who are a little controversial. They are going to be guests in the upcoming weeks. And, you know, some of these conversations have already already been recorded. So there's no issues here in terms of rescheduling or anything like that. No, I guarantee you, you are going to hear from some names, some you haven't even heard from uh, in a while, and some you may have heard from, but not in this level of detail. We are, we are going to get below the surface and find out about the controversy, find out about who they really are. They're going to answer some of these tough questions. That's the name of the game. You know, so stay tuned to Duke Loves Wrestling because I'm telling you, year eight will be the greatest year in the history of this show. I'm going to continue to push it. OK, all the humanoids out there who don't want me to interview certain people and all this stuff. Hey. Too bad. And for everybody out there who do want to hear other people that maybe they haven't heard them have a, a legacy interview before, because that's what we're delivering here. 
legacy interviews. These are conversations that are going to last and stand up to the test of time. I don't care about wrestling rumors. And I don't care about half truths. I don't care about nonsense. No, we go directly to the source. We get the information. We find out who this person really is. And it's something that stands up. You can play this 20 years from now. You can play it for their ancestors. And people are going to say, yes, that's the real person. Wow. I learned something new about that person that I may not have known before. That is what we deliver here on Duke Loves Wrestling, and we do that because of you great listeners out there. That's what you demand, and that's what I deliver. That's right. So before we have Tony Schiavone take us out, I'm going to play one more special uh, message here congratulating us on eight years, and certainly it's, it's one of my favorite people in the world representing our favorite brand that we love to talk about here on Duke Loves Wrestling. Check out this special message from our man, Matt, from Strictly for the Culture. And then right after that, our man, Tony Schiavone, will take us out. Catch you next time. Hey, Duke, this is Matthew J. representing Strictly for the Culture. And on behalf of the entire team, I just want to say congratulations to you on year number eight of your incredible podcast. Now, you and I have had a number of conversations about consistency in the importance of it and how it is needed to not only differentiate ourselves from others, but in order to establish ourselves. And that's what we've done in these last eight years, creating a platform where you not only tell why you love wrestling, but you've afforded that opportunity to others to come out and say what this sport, this form of entertainment, this thing of ours what it means to them. And you've talked to people who are Hall of Famers, legends, current television and independent stars, as well as promoters, fans. And you even had some amateur wrestlers on here just to talk about this thing that professional wrestling is and what it means to them. And that's important because what you're doing, Duke, is you're building community. And in that building of community, you're doing something else, and that's building culture. You know, we applaud that, and we approve, most definitely. And this culture that you're building, Duke, it's important, the consistency that you're showing, because it can never be done behind a paywall. It will never be done by posting a subjective list that actually divides the community. And it most certainly cannot be done by individuals who will post five-hour rants tearing down others based on their race and gender. What you're doing, Duke, is important. What you're doing is appreciated and it's vital. Especially right now, we're in an era where everybody is about the brand. And their pursuit of the brand comes at the compromise of integrity, because the compromise of truth, it's the compromise of actually building. You're the antithesis of all those things, Duke. The consistency you bring, the character you've shown, and the quality of work that you provide on a weekly basis for eight years deserves all respect, accolades, and praise. And that's what we're looking to do here. Thank you again for being here, Duke. Thank you for the contributions you bring. We look forward to year number 9, 10, 11, 12, and beyond. Keep going, my brother. Keep representing. Keep those humanoids hiding, slapping thighs, and telling lies. Much respect, dude. Till next time, be kind to yourselves and be kind to others. Take it away, Tony Schiavone. This is Tony Schiavone, and we're definitely out of time on Duke Love Wrestling. 